All right. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Lure Lab. Another episode here on the Serious Angler Network. And as always, I am your host, the Captain Andrew Full. And today's episode is going to be a really cool one. We're diving into the creative side of fishing, and that is pouring your own soft plastics. And there's probably no one better to get on than the man from Do It Molds himself, Brennan Chapman. And we are basically going to dive into just how to get started, why you should pour your own stuff, and the whole process. So I hope everyone who tunes in enjoys this episode. This is something that I've been thinking about putting on since the inception of the show because um, there's a lot of creativity and a lot of thought you can put into pouring plastics, pour, pouring hooks onto certain jig head molds to fine tune exactly what you want as an angler. And that's one of the coolest things about do it molds is the fact that you can create stuff to your liking and not just buy stuff from a box store. So without further ado, let's get Brennan on here and talk about probably one of his favorite things to do besides go fishing. What's up, man? What's up? Thanks for having me. I hope I can live up to the hype uh, yeah, that you just hype. displayed in that intro. Wow, right. pressure's on. <laughs> no, there's no pressure here. We we know what comes to the table. So no, I, I mean... It's cool. Like I watch videos on it all the time and I just unfortunately haven't quite had the time myself to put into it. I have the stuff and I need to do it. It's just, you know, the juggle of life, especially when you throw kids into it and guiding full time. So what's up with you lately? Like you're out there catching fish, having some fun in derbs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, derby season's probably three quarters of the way over for me already here in the Midwest. So yeah, it'll be cold um, soon. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of flashed by. It's crazy. It's August felt like it was like April yesterday, but yeah, I've been doing a ton of fishing, ton of working, um, trying to play a little harder than I work, mm -hmm. uh, in these summer months, some days, cause it, it is kind of slower, um, for us this time of year. So it's easier to sneak out and do some fishing. So yeah. taking full advantage of that when I can, that's for sure. Some sneaky product testing, I'm sure as well. A little bit. Yeah, yeah. sure. And speaking of that, like we're we're diving into like pouring soft plastics today. Doing molds here recently has released some kick-ass molds for pouring soft plastics, like sneaky flipping baits and etc. So I think we're gonna dive into that a little bit. But before we really go into it, right? Like let's jump right into the show here. And the big question is why should people pour their own soft plastics? Sure. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple aspects um, to the soft bait side, lead, the lead side, which um, for anybody that's not familiar with do it molds, like what we're primarily known for is what we do on the, the lead side. Um, that's what our products originated from. It's kind of our bread and butter. It's making lead molds for jigs, sinkers, things like that. So drop shot sinkers, bass jigs, you name it. Um, the soft bait side, another big part of our business. Um, couple aspects to that too um, that, that are much different than lead. Um, there is a cost savings aspect um, to the soft bait side, but it's not as prominent like you'll find on the lead side. Um, people that are using our soft bait molds um, to save money are probably remelting old baits down. So that is kind of one cool thing. Um, you know, as you collect, like, dude, I, I go fishing almost every night after work and like, you know, the Kitex, the Senkos, they just pile up in the corner of the boat. You can melt them all right back down and um, shoot them into a mold and be fishing a brand new bait again. So that's really cool. There's a cost saving side to that. Um, a lot of people like that. I like that. <laughs> I like saving money. Um, but probably the bigger thing with the soft plastic side is the customization. Um, and not just like little hobbyist, like making like some crazy color in his basement, but like people that are, you know, taking ideas or forages in their bodies of water and matching it, you know, to their need or to their liking and having tournament success from it too. So um, I would say the customization thing to me is probably the coolest part about soft plastics. That's just me, but yeah. Absolutely. It's not when it comes to pouring soft plastics, right? There's two different types, if I remember correctly, there's like a hand pour and then an ejection. And can you kind of elaborate on the difference between hand pours and injection molds? Sure. Yeah. So an injection mold um, is probably what most people are familiar with. 
Um, that's what most of your, your baits, you know, the commercial baits that you buy from a Bass Pro Shops, Tackle Warehouse, whatever, Omnia, um, you know, that's what most of those baits are coming out of is a injection style mold, a commercial mold, of course, bigger machine, not hand injected, but your, your injection molds are going to require an injector, right? In the name, um, they're going to have a little hole in the top. You're going to have some clamps on the side. You're going to put your plastic, you know, once it's been heated up, color, everything added, and then you're going to inject it into the mold where a open pour or hand pour mold is literally just one surface. There's not another half to it. There's not, you know, another axis to it. Um, it's flat and you pour it. And because of that, you do have one hard flat side all the time, um, which in some baits is really desirable. Um, in others, it doesn't matter. And then in others, it's terrible. So yeah, just kind of the nature of an open bore mold. Um, yeah. I, I love open pour molds when it comes to like really thin, long drop mm -hmm. chop baits. But then yeah. again, there are places and times like times and places for round circular drop shot baits where they outfish a hand pour worm so for sure yeah i think i i just appreciate the heck out of open pour like old school plastics i just think it's super cool but original uh, we, robo worms right yeah we don't have a ton of open pour molds um most of ours i'm going to say 98 percent of them are going to be um injection molds but mm -hmm. Super cool. You can do some cool stuff with them for sure. Um, the one one really cool thing to the open pour side is the amount of customization that's opened up because you don't you're not limited um, with your range of colors, right? If you have a dual or triple injector, you're capable of shooting two or three colors at once. Well, when you're hand pouring, you it's totally up to you how much time you got. You know, you can how keep many layers. Colors. Yeah, how many layers you want to do? You know, so yeah. yeah. It, there is like quite the art to you, like when you see a hand pour an open pour person pour like a really creative bait it's like man you want to pay the money for it if it works because you're like that thing took some time to make like right it's yeah impressive yep there's some there's some appreciation uh to it and then also it's just cool like i don't know i, I buy i still like i'll buy people's custom you know open pour craw or whatever and you know, no two look alike. That's for sure. And, and oh. every now and then you get a bag. It's like, dang, those are pretty good. And then you never get that same color again. It's like, dang. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and that's the other issue too that I find with like the open pores, even with robo worms. Like sometimes if you look at bag from bag to bag, they'll be just slightly different than if mm -hmm. one's in the sun for too long, they fade fast. And I feel like when you have an injection mold, the color tends to stay more true longer then open pores. And I think that's like a big fact, like a big thing that people need to pay attention to, especially like robo worm style baits, like make sure you hide them from the sun. Yeah. I, I, that's interesting. You bring that up. I don't know if that's because that is a, uh, a dyed colorant and not a pigment based colorant. Mm -hmm. Maybe that could have something to do with it too. I, I don't exactly know, but yeah. Um, I know, I know older robo worms never used to do that, but then like in the last three or four years, they started like fading out on me. If I leave them on the deck of the boat too long, I'm like, this is weird. What's that old saying about, uh, they don't make it like they used to facts. Yeah. So it is, it is what it is. So like diving into it though, like how does someone get started if they want to dive in and start pouring their own soft plastics or recycling soft plastics that they use throughout the day or week or month and they want to melt them down how does one get started into it like walk through the process of purchasing the equipment for now and then we'll move into the process of pouring the plastic as we get going through here sure yeah um so equipment what you need like bare minimum to get started of course you're going to need your mold um that is pro i mean Initially, that's going to be your, your largest expense. And our molds range from, uh, you know, we're talking about some open pour stuff. I think some of those are in like the $20 range. Um, you know, it can range up to, to three, four or $500, depending on cavity count and, and detail and size of the baits. So um, it's a range, but we, we have this line of molds called our Essential Series line, which are sand cast aluminum versus C, uh, CNC billet aluminum. 
Um, so they're much more cost effective if you're looking to get into this and just try it out, see if it's something you like. Uh, those are like a $45 investment to get started. So um, I'd recommend taking a look at our Essential Series line of molds. Um, if you're familiar with, everybody listening to this is familiar with, with Mac Scent products, you know that matted duller finish that's really prominent in the Mac Scent versus most other baits you finish, fish? Um, that's going to be a similar effect or, or texture that you're going to get out of our essential series line than you would with the CNC billet aluminum. So because of that, they are a little bit cheaper. However, I like, and you're a great lakes fisherman. You could probably attest to this. Like there's situations where that matted finish is preferred. Oh, it, it's, um, and there's a lot of times that it's preferred, honestly, when uh, you're I agree. as natural yeah. as possible, unless they're on like super chromey like wild foiled bait fish which doesn't happen all that often where i'm at it's always matte colors right so but like right. now based on the type of mold that is crafted right to pour plastics you get different color textures out of baits is what you're saying yeah so so i guess what i was setting up there is um if you're looking to just kind of get into this um you're not sure if you want to go gung-ho yet take a look at our essential series line of molds um, they're $45. Uh, they're a great value. Honestly, they really are. Um, so aside from your mold, you're going to need your plastic. You're going to need colorants, glitters, an injector. I just kind of ran through all that really quickly because we have kits available that have all of those items ready to go. So really, if you get on our website, you find some soft bait uh, molds that you're interested in. Drop one of those in your cart. Go find the soft bait kit. Get that and you're ready to go. Um, the only thing that's not included in that kit is literally a microwave and a Pyrex glass cup, you know, measuring cup for you to heat your plastic in. And, and a spoon. We don't send you a spoon. You, you gotta get your own spoon. Don't, don't take your mom and dad's fine china don't silver do spoon to do yeah. it. But or their microwave. Before we get into the process of pouring on plastics, I feel like there's a safety warning that should be heated to whoever wants to start to this and like being smart about handling the Pyrex glass right and the injector so like in these kits that do it mold cells are there safety equipment that comes in or what would you recommend people buy in order to protect sure. their hands and face from bubbling plastic yeah so um one of the kits that we do sell and i should have mentioned this there's two different price points on the kits there's one that has more more a couple more featured items and then larger quantities of those items and then one that's just kind of more bare bones. Hey, get me started. I'll supply my own my own gloves. Sorry, um, but one kit does come with gloves. Yes, um, just general safety with pouring plastics. Um, this goes for most things: custom tackle, airbrushing, you name it. Um, but things like with heat, especially, uh, yeah, you got to have your gloves. No doubt, you know your plastic. You're going to heat it to 350 degrees. You don't want that on your skin. So you, you wear gloves every time. Um, if you're in an enclosed area, you know, if you're not in your garage, um, if you're not outside, um, if you don't have, you know, moving air through a room, um, wear a respirator in that case. But if you're in a vast area, you've got airflow, you're outside, you're in your garage with the door cracked open, you're golden. But just some general safety stuff. It's not, it's not like scary stuff. You know, it's pretty basic, like just be smart, wear gloves, you know, you don't need a hazmat suit, but no, no, wear, wear some burn proof gloves because I'm sure you have a few war wounds. I don't, I don't, I uh, knock on wood. You probably just jinxed me. I'm probably going to have my so first sorry. accident tomorrow, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I have. So yeah. Has any, have you seen any like crazy things happen to people pouring plastic from not like following the safety precautions that we should probably take? Sure. Yeah. So this is an opportunity to throw a coworker of mine named Drake under the bus. <laughs> I knew where I'm going to take go. full advantage of this. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope we can like sound bite this so I can send this to him too. But yeah, I watched Drake burn his hands once uh, by not wearing gloves. So um no no it, it wasn't anything like super serious but yeah um Ouch. wear gloves if you get plastic that's 350 degrees on your skin it's it's gonna hurt you so wear gloves yeah so 
I guess this leads us into the process of pouring the plastics, right? Like we've got the safety equipment covered. We got what you need. So you have your setup all set up. You're outside in the garage. What do you recommend people do to start the process? And is there a mold that you recommend that might be the easiest one for them to inject to get started? And then kind of like dive into the process and elaborate on it so the viewers can get the full understanding of the process of doing it beauty okay yeah so um as far as molds that i would recommend i, I mean i would i would just i would note that they all pour pretty similarly like there's definitely some designs that like maybe have a little bit maybe a little bit more quirky than others that like are, are far less problematic just due to the nature of the design. It's, it's just kind of how some molds are, right? Like some molds, like you're going to have a higher defect rate than others. That's just, that's how it goes. Um, so I wouldn't, that said, I, I wouldn't be nervous to like, you know, go look for the mold that's going to give you the best result every time. Like, don't look at it like that. You can remelt everything and shoot it back down. If you have a, a defective bait, whatever, um don't worry about that think about what you use and and therefore lose the most of um whether it be a senko swim bait flipping bait beaver bait whatever it is just something you know that's a big part of your arsenal that you go through like crazy pick up a mold like that and uh start shooting that one and then what was the second part of that question that was diving into the, the process, process the whole sure. the entire process from like start to begin we got all the equipment covered and what you need to get started but like somebody's got it at their table in the garage and they're ready to do it like mm -hmm. maybe mixing in the plastic and the coloring and the glitter like dive right in okay cool yeah so like let's assume that you have your mold you have everything in front of you already um so you've you've got your plastisol which your plastisol is the medium it's the it's the liquid that's going to turn into your bait right um, it's a material called plastisol so your plastisol goes in the glassware i mentioned um it goes which is basically just like a cooking measuring cup glass right um, you pour your plastic in let's just assume you're doing like four ounces of plastic that's going to go in the microwave and then anybody that's new to this just getting started like do 30 minutes to one, or I'm sorry, 30 seconds to one minute intervals. Don't do 30 minutes 30 <laughs> seconds to one minute intervals. Um, when you're just getting started, just to get a feel for it um, and how long approximately it takes to heat up. I never like to recommend an exact time because wattages of microwaves kind of differ. There's also different, you know, there's just different variables to it, but um, for sure, just do 30 seconds to a minute long through your heat cycle. Um, and then the big thing to note with the heat cycle is when your plastic is heating up from its raw state to when it converts to a gel to where you could, in theory, shoot it into your mold, that that plastic has to stay at 350 degrees for it to convert to that, um, to properly set up. So another handy thing to have is a thermometer. Um, we, we sell them. One of the kits that we offer does include one. Um, I personally don't find them necessary to use. Like after you kind of get the hang of it, you know, like what it looks like, right? Kind of like fishing, right? Like you pull up and you're fishing a river and you see a current seamer and eddy and a minnow jumps and it's like, that just looks right. That's the same thing with your plastic. Like Got it. you'll just know Love it just it. looks right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah from there, sticking your finger in it, the test. No. Test. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it, but it looks right. You know? Yeah. Yep. Love it. Uh, so yeah, don't put your finger in there, but it looks <laughs> good. So the, the next thing you'd want to do from there is add your colorant and, and your glitter. So, um, your colorant is the material. It's like, you know, it's the paint, right? It's what gives it the color. Um, you know, we've got everything from white, green, pumpkin, black. I think we've got like 35 different colors. Um, and same thing goes for the glitters, you know, range of sizes, range of colors, whole nine yards. Um, you'd want to add your colorant and glitter at that time. And Once then from there, 350 degrees, then you add it and mix it in. Yep, exactly. So after it's been heated, um, you're going to want to add your colorant and glitter. And then you're just going to do little drops at a time. Um, if, if you want, you can kind of keep track of things as you go. Again, kind of like uh, the current seam uh, 
deal. Like, you know what, it, you don't necessarily have to record everything if you've been doing it because you know what looks right. So, you know, kind of just memorizing your recipes. But um, if you want, you can keep track of that stuff and get it dialed in and save recipes and, you know, can be really effective. But um, from there, assuming your, your colorant glitter, everything's all been added, you're happy with the result, you got the color that you want. You're going to introduce it to the injector. You could either pour it in by removing the nozzle and then pouring it in the top. I feel like a flight attendant right now. <laughs> or <laughs> how you put on your seatbelt. <laughs> right. And this is the part where everybody just ignores the flight attendant, yeah. like looks at their phones. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> or, or you can draw it up through the injector. Um, so you can put the nozzle in and then pull the plunger back. Which and one do you prefer? I personally prefer to pour it in from the top. I know it's a little bit more maybe dangerous in theory, but you're wearing gloves. Um, it's just, it's less messy that way, way less messy. So that's what I do. But um, you get less like when you pull it up, right? Like into the nozzle, like do you get more air bubbles that way sometimes too? Or is it like pretty full um, bubbles out of this plastic? I, I wouldn't even say that it's, that it's necessarily an air bubble thing that I've noticed or like what sways me to do it the other way. It's more, like I said, just like the mess um you know assuming you put the nozzle down in the plastic and you pull it out well as soon as you pull it out it's automatically like start it's instantly like starting to cure or set up mm -hmm. um you know and then you're trying to go from sprue hole to sprue hole with this like clump of drying plastisol on the end and it's just kind of messy so especially if you're doing like dual injections which that's a whole nother thing if you want to get into that i'm sure we could but um Anyways, so you're going to uh, then take your mold, which, by the way, already has two clamps on it. I forgot to say that. Um, you're going to put your clamps on your mold, and then you're ready to shoot it um, once your plastic's in your injector. The shooting process is really simple. I mean, you're literally just going to, like, push down, and in between each cavity, maybe it's just got one sprue hole, one runner that goes down and feeds all the cavities, or maybe it has multiple sprue holes, but... Per every sprue hole, I would hold it down for like five seconds. So you just do an injection slowly, hold it down for five seconds, move on to the next cavity or mold, right? Yeah. So, and then yeah. also with that hole, it's important to almost overrun it over the top, right? Like you never want to shortchange it from what I've read. Yeah, great point um, for sure. So your plastic, when it's after you shoot it, it's, it's immediately going to start vacuuming. It's going to start drawing down. So you'll see in the sprue hole of the mold, um, you can see it at the top, right? So like after you pull the injector off, you can see through, you know, where you just shot the plastic in. If you wash it, it'll start to draw down. What you don't want to happen is that, you know, plastic start to draw down to the point where it reaches a, a gate of a cavity. Hmm. Um, the gate is the point where it pulls plastic from. If it reaches that and starts to draw air in, you're going to have an air pocket in that cavity. Mm -hmm. So you want to avoid that. And one way to avoid that is by topping off the sprue hole with extra plastic. Got it. Makes sense. Yep. So when it comes to like mixing colors, obviously the less drops of color edited into the plastisol gets you a lighter color and the more drops get you a darker color, I would assume uh not necessarily darker like as in shade but transparency opacity or, yeah gotcha. for sure yep okay. so um yeah like if you're doing black for example um your your plastisol once it's heated is perfectly clear right it's it's crystal mm -hmm. clear it looks like water but it's like gel um so what what happens when you add plastisol to it yeah it'll start to take on that color but the more drops you put in the the more opacity it's going to have um and then one other thing um on this subject we do have two lines of uh of colorant available uh essential series and x2 colorant the x2 colorant is more dense in pigment so it naturally has a tendency to be more opaque um, where the essential series line is more transparent translucent so uh, you can kind of fine tune stuff that way too. You know, if you want to do like a purple them, smoke, yeah. what like, was that? Can you mix them together too? Yep. To like, yep. really cool for colors. sure, 
for sure. So like uh, Andy, like purple smoke, right? Like yeah. out on Lake Erie, it's a color you're familiar with, right? Yeah. 100%. Okay. Yes. You great know, smoke smoke is. Right. So purple smoke, for example, like if, if we were doing four ounces of purple smoke, um, it's crazy because that that's probably four ounces. There's probably four or five drops of black in there and then stir it up and then you're going to add purple and you're going to add a bunch of black glitter hmm. and it gives it that smoke effect. Just those couple drops of that black will give it that smoke effect just barely, but it doesn't change the transparency much, right? They're still pretty yeah. transparent. So that, that's kind of an example of, uh, that's cool. yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That, that like in my brain, I'm like, Oh, what kind of colors could I make once I can finally find time to do this? This sounds fun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you can do all sorts of crazy stuff. That's for sure. So my question though, I have another question running onto this, you know, we're kind of going to get into more advanced stuff here real fast, but why do people put salt in their baits and this is for the viewership and how do you perfect how much salt you want and how does that affect the pouring process okay sure i'll start with the process part it, it doesn't really affect the process much uh other than you're you're you've got one more step you're just introducing salt to your your so plastic once it's at 350 degrees yep. you would add the salt in exactly yep okay. yep so um one thing i would say on the salt though is i would probably add that first before i would add my colorant um it, it i wouldn't say it changes it much but it it does give it like kind of a haze it will it will have some effect on the the color um mm. the end result so it's smart to put that in first generally um but salt's added for a couple reasons generally i know a lot of people like think maybe taste or scent um although that could be a tertiary benefit it's definitely not like why people use it um it's mainly used for a sinking rate um what i that that's probably its number one use i would say and then also softness it can it can really soften up a bait um and just kind of unlock action that you probably didn't know you had with the design until you added salt to the bait and got the right formula um but it can be really powerful for action too and you probably want to start with less salt and then like as you're pouring them maybe add a little bit more in like each run to see where that desired is because you probably don't want to go and dump an entire cup of salt into your four ounces of no. plastic salt no doubt yeah that that goes with everything bait making i mean you, uh everything in the soft bait world anyways um maybe not so much lead or airbrushing um but in the soft bait world for sure like once you put something in you can't take it out so start light ease your way in until you find out what what works and uh try to replicate it write it down memorize it do whatever yeah. you got to do yeah and if you're smart you'd write it down as you're doing it yeah. maybe in like tally marks until that color gets ready like one drop tally two drops tally for those who are listening i because should write this down that's good advice a lot I've of times like, like the way i do things right up like oh shoot was that eight drops nine drops or ten drops oh we'll figure it out next time and then right. next time like, oh, shoot, the color's too dark or it's too light you're like man it was really 18 drops dang yeah i lost right. count at seven because we get distracted so maybe that's a good general practice tally up your marks right for how right. many colors and then after it's done and you have it the way you like maybe move it into a master sheet like a recipe portfolio you're like your mom and grandma's cookbook for sure yeah i mean honestly though once you get once you get good enough with this like you you can color match anything that you've ever seen on the market if you want to make it look identical you can do it in five minutes yeah um or or make it better or maybe not better but like your take on it that you prefer that works better at your fishery mm. um i i do stuff like that all the time like just a, a different twist on okeechobee craw or something and Maybe it doesn't make a difference, but you know, there's days where I believe it does and I want them in my boat for that reason. So are you a big fleck guy or no flake guy? Um, both, Depends. both. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I've got this weird thing in my head when I'm, when I'm small mouth fishing, like I prefer to oversimplify, um, and prefer less glitter, I guess, in those scenarios, um, cleaner water for sure. Although like purple smoke, I love that on the Great Lakes still. So that completely defies my point. But um, 
but yeah, I, I guess I don't, I, I use plenty of both, dude. Yeah. I don't know. How about you? Uh, it depends, right? Like I tend to lean very generic, basic, bland colors, but I do find myself when it gets like, I try to follow the jerk bait rule of law. You know, if it's sunny, you go chrome or trans translucent sure. if the water's clear and sunny, or if it's cloudy and the water's clear or stained, you run more opaque colors. So I try to think of it in the same way of like when I'm flipping grass, I'm like, you know, it's really sunny out. It's calm. Maybe they'll bite something with more flake in it, like bright, shiny flake, like a gold and a purple and a green pumpkin. And when it gets cloudy, then I'll simplify and go to more of like a black flake. And I think it's something yeah. to do with like the reflection in the grass and the way the sun comes through. It just gives it that a little bit more glimmer, even though I feel like it's been scientifically proven that flake doesn't matter. And it's just all confidence in what you have. Cause there's been days where it's bright and sunny and all I have is green pumpkin, black flake, and I catch them just as good. But yeah, sure, sure. Fishing is all about confidence of what you think they're going to bite. And if you throw what you think they're going to bite, they're probably going to bite it. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess my only thing is like uh, anything that reflects light, I, I have to believe is going to have some sort of effect under the yeah. water. Um, wh whether that's good or bad that given day or that given second to that given fish, you know, you don't know, but um, I got to believe it has some effect. So, oh, um, it's funny, like drop shotting on the Great Lakes when they're on a flatworm bite. Well, put it out there right i will literally have four to five different color flatworms on my deck and if the fish are being moody i will throw every one of them at that fish until one of them bites it because i'm like they're gonna bite one of these it's max scent. like <laughs> it's just what color do you want in this situation right for sure. sometimes every fish is different it's crazy so you should, you just have to be prepared for that yeah i i am a believer in um in highlights like mm -hmm. any, any iridescence, I, I really do believe in that. Um, and and similar to, similarly to the scales I, or the, the glitter, sorry, like I'm sure there's days where it makes no difference. And I'm sure there's days where it makes a little bit of difference. And I'm going to try to be the guy that can uh, have the bait that just makes a little bit of difference every time I can. So like if I'm in a group of guys and I see them, because I try to, I don't pay attention, but I try to like look out of my eye and see what everyone else is fishing around me. So if everyone's fishing big, like flipping big jigs around me, I might go something really small mm -hmm. and flip that grass just to see if I can get a bigger bite. Or if everyone's flipping what looks like green pumpkin, I might go to like a black or green pumpkin with a lot of flake just to see if I can get one bigger bite than what everyone else is in my area. Sure. Yeah. Well, one, one other thing on the subject of uh, just, you know, iridescence, flashy, things like that. Do you, uh, do you throw swim jigs much and have you ever used like a mylar flash in your swim jig? Do you, are you a believer in that? If I'm throwing a swim jig, I want, I want flash in it, especially yeah. if it's a white one. Like um, I actually have some over here behind me and I know do it molds has a really cool mold for making swim jigs. So you can mm -hmm. tie up the ones that you want, but beast coast has a working man's one. That's got like a real short hook shank on it and it's white and it has like pink and blue mylar flash in it. Oh, cool. Yeah. And I'm a big steelhead guy. Like I love steelhead fishing and I tie all my own marabou jigs. I probably have like, 17 or 18 different colors of flash shabu and i'll tie up white jigs mm -hmm. and on a day that i know they're eating jigs i will literally just rip through white jigs with like different strands of flash shabu in it or whatever strands mylar flash to see what they actually want to bite on that hole because every fish is different sure but yeah if they're on minnows they're going to eat something minnow colored it's just what color they want today in my flash Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no i uh I'm a, I'm a big big fan of flashaboo mylars accents things like that i uh I, i'm a firm believer in anything moving you know like you think of like we were talking about steelhead like streamers things like that it's crazy like just the motion of that mylar material it's so natural it just gets them to go um oh, yeah. I, dude like my swim jigs i'm telling you like it's probably 30% mylar, 70% skirt, and the skirt's sparse, you know? Yeah. Like, there's not it. much there. It's a lot of mylar. Yeah. And then I think 
with a swim jig, honestly, the most important thing is whatever the trailer you no put doubt. on for yeah. the day with flash. Yeah. And always trim your skirt. So people yep. don't like to trim it. Yep. So, but I want to get back to the pouring stuff here because I do have a few more questions on top of mind. One, you know how you can reheat plastic. How many times can you reheat plastic before it goes bad? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So heating pla or reheating plastisol is definitely different than your initial heat. That's like one critical thing to note right off the bat. Like the first time you heat your plastic, when it, when it comes in like the milk jug and you pour it in the glassware and it looks like milk, that step is completely different from what I'm talking about here. So we're talking about working from like a, a let's say you walk up to your workbench and like you've got leftover green pumpkin from two weeks ago okay like that's what we're working with um what i would do is take that out of the glassware like what you'll find when you're working with this stuff if you like pour it on your table you leave it in the glassware whatever as soon as it solidifies which does not take long you can peel it off use it you know it's really easy to clean up and remove but anyways take that out of the glassware cut that up into like inch by inch or two inch by two inch cubes Mm -hmm. And then we sell a material called stabilizer, which is one of the ingredients that's already in your plastisol when you buy it. Um, however, every time it goes through a heat cycle, you're burning more and more of that agent off. So you have to reintroduce it. Um, so what I recommend is for every ounce of heated plastic or, or used plastic, do two to three drops of stabilizer. So if you got four ounces, do eight drops of stabilizer right would be a great place to start and that's after it's already been cut up right once yeah. it's been cut up you've done your drops of stabilizer put it in the microwave heat it up um put it in there for like a minute pull it out it's going to be partially melted down stir it up a little bit put it back in for another minute same thing and then i would assume by the third minute or two minutes and 30 seconds it's ready to shoot again well that is awesome now yeah. when you're re now to jump to recycling baits, you went through an entire bag of like coffee plastics, right? Like when you melt that down, does it retain the coffee scent? That's my first question. And then two, when you reshoot it, does it maintain like the dexterity and the consistency of the plastic when you reheat it like before previously? Sure. Yep. So um, there's a couple things on that. The scent. Um, Generally speaking, and, and I can't say this with confidence on the coffee deal um, because I haven't tried it. So I, I have not tried it on a coffee scented bait, but we do sell coffee scent if you wanted to re-add it. Um, but yeah, um, I would think that it would retain the, the same smell. Like I've melted down other uh, companies' baits that like I, I don't, I'm weird, dude. I work with plastic and stuff for a living. So like I can smell a brand and I'm sure you're the same way Andy. you fish all the time. Like it doesn't even have to have like a garlic scent or a anise scent, like some signature scent. You just smell their plastic and you know, it's like, Oh, that's that brand, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, you know what I'm talking about? So yeah. like, I, I, what I'm saying is like, I can, that scent retains all the way to the end after I reshoot it, I can take, x company's bait shoot it into a do it mold and like it still smells like x company's bait when i'm done so i have to believe the scent at least most of it would carry over that that comes up with like an interesting thought like what if you took like a green pumpkin ocho that's coffee scented with like a green pumpkin gary yamamoto sanko so you get the salt content with this with the coffee scent hear me out and you melt them down together like do you have like the perfect sanko at that point I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> or, or, or you've just created a monster. I don't know. Yeah, like, like a little like, Frankenstein worm. I don't know. Like this might work or this might be total crap, but like that sounds like interesting, like Frankenstein scientific projects that some people probably do and don't even talk about. Like, like who yeah, maybe you're like maybe I like this mold. KBD secret all these years. He'll come out and tell us now that he's retired. That's like, what he's hey, doing this whole you know, time. I love this punching mold that do a mold has, but I love my coffee scent baits and I don't really like this base. I have a bunch of them. So let me melt them down and shoot them into this mold. Yeah. I wonder if people exactly do stuff happened. like that. Yeah. All those years. That's what he was doing. <laughs> Makes sense now. <laughs> sneaky, sneaky. Yep. So Brennan, 
you know, is there anything else that you feel like we are missing here that we should touch on? Um, not necessarily. I guess I would just say like anybody that's ever been on the fence about getting into tackle making, like if you think it's like too much time or too difficult, like just go to our website, request a free catalog, get the catalog, look through it. There's videos, links to videos. You can watch various videos that are going to show you the whole process. It'll take a couple minutes of your time. Um, and just see if it's something you're interested in. I realize it's not for everybody. Um, you know, I, I get it, but it's not that hard to do. And, uh, once you know what you're doing, it doesn't take too much time. Like, yeah. I, I mean, you can walk, you can walk up to your, you know, workbench in your garage before you go out for the afternoon fishing and whip up a batch of baits in 10 minutes and head out the door, you know? So it's cool. Okay. Great for rainy days and winters. Yeah. Agreed. So this actually, before we wrap it up here, I do have Another question that just came to my mind, you know, once you get the bait out of the mold, you take the clamps off, is there a process to finish the baits or can you literally just pull them off, cut them off, whatever the the string is that's attached? I can't think of the terminology at, mm -hmm. at this point, but can you just cut them off and finish them? But I've seen people that like throw them into buckets to like rinse them and then hang them. Like what's the process yeah. of like basically finishing the cure? Yep. So when you shoot your bait, right? Like a, as soon as you shoot it and the clamp is still on, assuming you've only shot that mold a handful of times and you haven't shot it all day, um, you're going to be able to take that bait out probably within 30 seconds. I mean, it, it gears like really, really quickly. Um, so you're going to take the clamps off, pull it out. The reason I mentioned if you've been shooting the mold all day, like if you've been shooting 350 to 400 degree plastic into a metal mold repetitively for an extended period of time, that mold's going to get hot. That mold's going to retain heat. That mold's going to push the heat into the bait and it's going to take longer for the bait to cure and set up in between shots. Mm -hmm. So naturally the shorter amount of time you've been shooting, the faster it's going to take for them to be like workable and you can handle them without melting your hands. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the reason people use water um, is they put the bait in there to cure it quicker. Like instant cool. Mm -hmm. Yep. It just, it just cures it quicker. But in theory, where I was going with that is in theory, you could take the bait out of the mold in 30 seconds and be on the water. Um, it's not necessary. If you're storing them in a bag, this is when I would say do the water trick. Um, or even if you're not going to do it, if you're going to put it in a bag, um and it's not going in the water they at least in the water bowl it at least needs to sit out and um you know be allowed to cure straight before it goes in a bag or anything that could like manipulate a tail or curve a worm and you know what i mean so eh, makes sense to me yeah perfect so you know we do have a do it molds juice of the show because that's the best part of the show here at the end. And I guess, is there one tip or technique that you can share to help simplify the process or make pouring so enjoyable that somebody who does it for the first time would want to keep doing it? Okay. That's a great one. Is that two different questions or I get to pick one of the you two? You can pick one or answer both. It does not matter. It's your question to answer. Okay. Read me the first one one more time. That sounded more appealing. Oh, now I have to go back and think of what it was. Oh, again. no. So what was it? So the second one was to simplify and make people who do it the first time want to do it more. Okay. And then what nope, was... Don't even say the other one because then you're going to get an idea in my head. Yeah. Got it. Right, okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're good, dude. Um, I didn't write it down. I literally free. Okay. It. Okay. My yeah. Head. So we're both shooting from the hip here. Beauty. <laughs> uh, no. So anybody that's just getting in, getting into it, um, easiest way to get into it and probably the way to set yourself up for the most success, most fun, uh, ease of frustration, go get a kit, just like first go request a catalog go to our website request a free catalog the catalogs are about this thick for everyone who it's like um a phone book your it's local got, phone it's book. even got a small mouth on it. it doesn't have this chicken scratch that's just mine but yeah you even got a small on it um but go go grab a catalog um 
you know, just kind of understand what we have to offer. Like, I think most people's minds like are blown when they open the catalog and see everything you can make from, you know, airbrushing hard baits to making swim jigs, drop shot sinkers, whatever. Um, you know, one of my favorite things is about the catalog is how many treble hooks you can actually buy and how mm -hmm. much better the pricing is in my opinion. Oh yeah. Bulk hooks, dude. Yeah. We got you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you, all the good ones too. Right. Like your eyes are open. Like you're like, oh my gosh, I can buy a thousand of those things for like 10 times cheaper than if I bought that amount worth <laughs> of 50 packs, you know? So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no doubt. Um, but no, go ahead, grab yourself a catalog, um, take a look at it, see if, if we've got something in there that might suit your needs. Like I said, things that you lose a lot, things that are expensive to replace. Uh, things that you enjoy fishing, right? So just find something in there like that. That's where I would start. And I promise you we have something because we have like a thousand different molds and that's not a joke. Um, and then and then get a kit and, okay. and go from there. Um, we've got a full range of videos on our website called the How We Do It series that are, you know, basically just a bank of educational videos to like kind of go through step by step with you um, once you have all the stuff that you need to kind of show you what to do and uh follow directions kind of let that thing show you what to do it, it won't point you in the wrong direction and have fun love it yeah that that catalog is like one of my favorite pastime reading materials because i literally sit there and i'm like there's so much here this is awesome and i'm like yeah <laughs> i can't yeah. read this because i'm gonna end up spending too much money so right. think yeah. of all the money you could save though andy yeah by pouring my own soft plastics right. like i i wonder if you can have you tried to reheat like meltdown max set and repour it um i have not but i have friends that have tried and i've been told that it does not work and i i know that they uh ran into failure like immediately when they tried it so it don't. just melts into a goo yeah don't don't try it anybody at home All i right. feel like everybody like knows somebody that's probably tried it that has to do it mold but yeah don't do it but would regular power bait work? Uh, I think power bait has problems too. Ah, so it's something that they do with the plastic that you can't reheat so. it. Yeah, ah, they got you. They pigeonholed you. I, I, I don't. I don't think power bait like has as big of a problem, but I don't think it's ideal. Hmm. Um, I, I don't think it's ideal to work with where the max scent you can't work with if you're trying to do Z Man uh, Elastec. Don't try that. Don't try that one either. That doesn't work. Yeah. So any like last tech companies like Strike Kings and Z Man, there's a couple other that use that technology too. Yeah, right? it, it's a TPE uh, plastisol. It's it's available everywhere. Um, it's it's a it's harder to work with. Um, it's not nearly as friendly with hand injections. I'll just say that it's really difficult to work with. It's actually difficult to work with uh, at a commercial scale too. Huh. Well, mm -hmm. leave it to the professionals. Let's right. just have fun and make crazy colors and see what we can catch bass on. Correct. That's right. Perfect. Well, thanks, Brendan. I appreciate you taking the time here tonight to get this recorded and up. And I hope all of our viewers enjoyed it. And while we're at this point, right, like if you did enjoy it, leave a comment down below if you're here on YouTube and let us know what you like. And there will also be a link down in the description to the Do It Molds website. So go over there and check it out. And I want to say... Thanks for coming on, Brennan, again. And we got to get you over here to the real smallmouth country and get you on some smallies soon. I know, dude. We, we keep talking about it, but we got to make it happen. It, yeah. The ball's in my court to make it happen because you've been kind enough to offer. It, yeah. It's up to me to make it happen now. So Let's figure it out. We'll figure it out, buddy. Thanks for Thanks. having me, though. Hey, yeah. And uh, I'm sure there will be more episodes of Round Do It Mold content I would like to in the future. And, also, another point here, who's viewing at, viewing in on YouTube, leave a comment if you want to see us talk about, like, the lead molds and stuff and hooks and getting real creative with things. I love – that's my favorite thing to do is sit in the garage and pour lead and change hook sizes and pour up jig heads with particular hook sizes for certain sizes of baits. And you no, get no. real technical with it uh, and really yeah. get the most action out of your bait and use actually a good hook. So, right. If you thought I was boring talking about plastics, if you have me on to talk about lead, I'll bore everybody to death because that's 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 <laughs> no, my that's my it's jam. <laughs> boring but important material to not only help people save money but to put more fish in the boat. So no that's doubt. the way I look at it. So 
Oh, thanks, man. We'll chat soon. Uh, go get home and get out of the office and have a good night. Thank you much. Thanks for having me. We'll chat soon. All right, everyone. Well, I want to say thank you for tuning into this week's episode here on the Lure Lab. And as you heard me ask you before, leave a comment down below if you like pouring soft plastics and maybe even what your process is. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up. We appreciate it. If you're on a podcast platform such as Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please leave a review. Helps these episodes be shown to more bass fishermen and fish people like you and I alike. And until next Saturday, we will see you then. Bye.